So again, thanks for your time this morning, and it's my pleasure to introduce to you, uh, and I'm happy to say probably the world's expert in resolvens, the resolution of inflammation, uh, Dr. Jess uh, Dolly. So uh, first of all, I'd like to thank John for the uh, flattering introduction. Um, I wouldn't necessarily justify myself, uh, describe myself as, a, as the world expert, but there are other people who have done quite a lot of work in this field. I was lucky to work with the, the person that discovered this field, so I guess that's where part of the expertise comes from. Um, these are my disclosures. Uh, I was lucky also to be, to, through some of our work, to found a company that with the aim of translating some of our basic work into the clinic, um, as well as I received funding from various research bodies that are listed, that are listed here. Um, as you all know, and John did a fantastic job this morning in introducing this aspect, inflammation is at the basis of many of the diseases that, will, that afflict our societies, that, if, that um, create a burden both in terms of uh, in terms of malaise, but also at an economic level on our societies. And for many years, the paradigm that has been used to treat inflammation is to block the signs and symptoms of inflammation. And whilst this has been effective, we, are, we all here have had some inflammatory disease, we've all taken non-steroidal, John mentioned Tylenol, there's a whole list of these drugs out there today, uh, including the biologicals, that have primary aim of inhibiting the production or the signaling of molecules that are thought to be fundamental for the inflammatory response. And those are primarily to fall into the categories of cytokines, chemokines, and the classic eicosanoids. Um, however, this approach comes with a number of negative side effects. First of all, it's only effective in about 50% of the population. So there's half of us that don't respond to these drugs. They do not promote tissue repair and recovery. And this is primarily important in those conditions that lead to degradation or damage to, to tissues and organs. One of the diseases that we're very interested in is rheumatoid arthritis, which leads to a degradation of the joints. And all the treatments that we have today will tr treat the inflammation, will reduce the pain but the bones that are damaged remain damaged. So that becomes a debilitating effect on the patient. They come with major systemic toxicity. We know many of the, the drugs affect the liver, affect the kidneys, and have all these negative side effects. And there is an aspect of resolution toxicity. And this primarily uh, is appreciated in the fact that these drugs suppress the immune system. That's what they're there to do and they expose us to things like infection. So many of the anti-inflammatories also lead to opportunistic infections. And this is because, as I mentioned earlier, it was thought, and this is, this is just a simple diagram of what we think of inflammation. We try and numb things down many, most often to help us appreciate the concept. And, it, and, and inflammation for, for, for many years was is, is divided into the, these two phases, the initiation and the resolution phase. And as John mentioned, under ideal conditions, inflammation is protective, it's self-resolving. It it's what keeps us functioning. And during the day, there is hundreds of inflammatory events happening in anyone's body at any point in time. Now, it was thought for many years that inflammation goes wrong because these molecules are produced during the initiation phase in very high amounts and they lead to chronic inflammation. So it was thought that by blocking the production of these molecules through the NSAIDs, the biologicals, etc., we could treat inflammation. But one aspect that became very apparent, especially uh, to my mentor uh, in the 80s, was the fact that for the most part, this aspect of the resolution was ignored. And this was because it was thought that Inflammation goes away just by itself. It just dissipates. It dissolves and it goes away because the molecules that are producing this inflammatory response, like the cytokines and chemokines, became, become diluted, and then eventually the cells walk out. Um, and they 
challenged this, this theory, this hypothesis, by looking for molecules that would be produced during this resolution phase that would reprogram the immune response. And to do this, they use a very simple system. They obtained inflammatory exudates from an experimental system. And it, these exudates were obtained from the initiation, so from the start of an inflammatory response, and from the resolution phase of an inflammatory response. And using a systems approach, we assess the cellular composition as well as cellular functions because it was known what the cellular composition was during the initiation and during the resolution and the cellular functions are different during initiation and resolution phase. And then using a lipidomics approach, measure those molecules that were known, like the classic eicosanoids, which are produced to amplify the inflammation, your prostaglandins, your leukotrienes, and look for structures that are produced to term that are different, that are produced during this, during this resolution phase, that are different and help terminate inflammation. And with this approach, it was found that omega-3 fatty acids like icosafentanoic acid and docosahexanoic acid that are enriched in, very, in a number of natural sources are precursors to molecules that are produced by enzymes. So these, are, these don't just appear by themselves. They are produced by enzymes in white blood cells. They have very defined structures and exert a very specific biological action, which is to reprogram the immune response. So it doesn't block the immune, they don't block the immune response, they reprogram the immune response to terminate inflammation. And this is at variance to what we know and what we use to treat inflammation, where we aim to block the immune response, where we aim to block inflammation. What we're doing here is we're telling the cell to behave in a more protective manner. And more recently, we found that N3-docosafentanoic acid and other fat and omega-3 fatty acids, which to date was only thought to be in an, an intermediate from icosafentanoic acid to docosahexanoic acid in the biosynthetic chain of fatty acids, was also a precursor to new families of mediators that regulate both white blood cells, so leukocytes, as well as, as the vascular endothelium. And the biology of these molecules is exerted via activation of cognate receptors, of specific receptors that are expressed on both leukocytes as well as stromal cells, so epithelial cells and endothelial cells, for example, to regulate the the, uh, the activation of inflammation. And they all have a very, they, they all have convergent actions in terms of their ability to regulate NF-kappa-B, which is a master regulator of a lot of the inflammatory genes that are involved in propagating inflammation, microRNA, and I'll come to that in a little bit, and heme oxygenase 1. And we, we, at least as far as we know, these molecules at biologically relevant concentrations do not activate nuclear receptors. The biology of these mediators has now been extended, at least in experimental systems, and we've got ongoing work also in humans, to many inflammatory conditions. So inflammatory bowel disease, obesity, sepsis, infection, uh, Alzheimer's, arthrosclerosis, as well as pain. And this really tells us one fundamental thing, that all these conditions which are characterized nowadays and appreciated to be inflammatory are characterized by a status of failed resolution. And this idea of failed resolution comes from either the inability of the host of the body to produce these co-resolving mediators or their inability to signal through their receptor because their signal, their receptors are either not expressed, they're reduced in expression, or they're not working well. And so their biological actions are lost. And we now know that these molecules are produced in the body even in the absence of inflammation. So they're not only there to terminate inflammation as we know it, when we see the signs and symptoms, redness, swelling, etc. But they're also, we think at least, they're also there to help maintain normal body function. We find these molecules in the brain at concentrations that are biologically active in cerebrospinal fluid, in the lymph nodes. We find them also in milk, and this suggests 
that these mediators are also important in infant development and infant protection, especially in the early days. And we heard from John the importance of, of nutrition in the early days of an infant, um, as well in the spleen. And the presence of lymph nodes, the mediators in lymph nodes and spleen tells us also that they're important in regulating immune responses to, to help us fend off um, infections, for example. And we recently found that there is crosstalk between microRNA and specific mediators through these G-protein coupled receptors, where in inflammatory exudates, we know that these microRNAs are present. So during an inflammation, microRNAs are produced in the cell. Some of them are even released through microvesicles. Um, and they regulate aspects of inflammation. The mediators, the pro-resolving mediators in particular through their receptors, activate a, cascade, a cassette of, of microRNAs that are important in regulating white blood cell responses. Um, and they do so, for example, here we have um, one of the microRNAs, uh, sorry, uh, mi microRNA 219 that is involved in regulating um, the production of leukotriene D4 via the regulation of uh, one of the, bi uh, the uh, lipid mediated biosynthetic enzymes, 5 lipoxygenase. We have microRNA 21 and 208 that are involved in regulation of uh, IL 10. And we have microRNA 146B that is involved in the regulation of TNF alpha. And all these, as these microRNA are activated by, this, by the uh, G-protein coupled receptor for resolving D1. And, and what we now know is that each of these pro-resolving mediators has its own cassette of microRNA that it activates. We also know that these mediators are essential in, um, in the, some of the anti-inflammatory and protective actions of of clinically very commonly used drugs such as statins and aspirin where they trigger the formation of specific molecules that are important in mediating their protective actions. And so for the rest of our, my talk, what I'd like to discuss is some of the more recent evidence that, we've, that we and others have put together on the crosstalk between the cannabinoid system and the pro-resolving mediators. This aspect of uh, circadian regulation or diurnal regulation of vascular SPM and their uh, importance in protecting us against cardiovascular disease, the role of lipid mediators in aging and the, the link between the, these two, um, and the utility of, of nanoporesolving medicines, which are microvesicles that are enriched in pro-resolving mediators in, uh, as potential new therapeutic um, tools. So recent studies um, that w found that lipoxin A4, which is a pro-resolving mediator produced from arachidonic acid, potentiates or is essential in, uh, in regulating some of the activation that is seen through the cannabinoid receptor one. And in these studies, what, they f what was found was that a lipoxin A4 and, um, potentiates the binding of uh, anandamide in brain slices, in urine systems. And this was important because when you look at the binding of an agonist to cannabinoid receptor 1, CB1, what you have is in the presence of lipoxin A4, there is a shift towards higher affinity of anandamide to its cognate receptor, CB1. And this was found to be important because when you put lipoxin A4 in an experimental system, it potentiated the biological actions of anandamide, suggesting that, uh, and, and further investigations were found that lipoxin A4 occupies a site that is distinct to that that, you, that is utilized by anandamide, and it increases the affinity of the receptor to its cognate ligands, suggesting that it is an, an allosteric modulation. So it, it makes anandamide and potentially other cannabinoids bind and signal better through their cognate receptor. 
And in collaboration with uh, Professor Derek Gilroy at UCL, we questioned whether cannabinoids, and in particular a, uh, a clinically relevant cannabinoid, um, was able to regulate the production of pro-resolving mediators and to promote resolution of inflammation. And here we used a very simple um, experimental system where s blisters were elicited in a forearm of healthy volunteers that leads to a temporary inflammatory response, peaking around four hours, and then it just goes away. This is the blood flow at the site of inflammation. And what we did was we treated healthy volunteers with either uh, a cannabinoid receptor, uh, uh, anabasum, or um, a, a, a corticosteroid, and looked at the temporal regulation of pro-resolving mediators, first of all, and here we found that lipoxane 4 reg is upregulated by this um, cannabinoid, an uh, anabasum, um, and this suggests that there is a feed-forward feed loop in the regulation of, um, of pro-resolving mediators with cannabinoids, where, where pro-resolving mediators regulate the affinity of these molecules to the receptor, but on the other hand, these uh, cannabinoids regulate the formation of pro-resolving mediators. So here we see an upregulation of lipoxane 4 by the higher dose of anabasum. Same thing for LXB4, resolving D1 and resolving D3. On the other side of, of the icosanoid um, profile, we see a downregulation of pro-inflammatory mediators, so leukotrienes, prostaglandins, that are involved in increasing, um, the, the prostaglandins are involved in increasing the, uh, the uh, edema at the site, and leukotrienes are important in recruiting leukocytes to the site, and all of these molecules are reduced by anabasum. Um, in some cases, with equipotency to prednisolone. And importantly, what we find is that neutrophils, which are the marker of, of inflammation here, are reduced by the doses given of both anab of anabasum to a similar level as prednisolone. So this suggests that through activating pro-resolving pathways, the increase in the biosynthesis of pro-resolving mediators, this cannabinoid regulates inflammation at least in a, in a dermal site in humans. And recently, we've been interested in understanding what regulates the formation of, of pro-resolving mediators and what are the physiological mechanisms that regulate the pro-resolving mediator biosynthesis in healthy people. And one aspect that is central to our physiology is the circadian clock. It regulates virtually every aspect of our physiology. And so we investigated the formation of pro-resolving mediators throughout the day. And here we use the lipid mediator profiling approach where we can measure substrate, precursors, bioactive mediators, as well as some of the further metabolites at in one, uh, in, um, it all together in order to give us an idea of the flux down these biosynthetic pathways. And what we found was that there was a temporal shift in healthy volunteers in the formation of these molecules. So from seven o'clock in the morning all the way through to the evening, there was a temporary regulation in the formation of these mediators. And this was primarily linked with the regulation of one family of mediators known as the uh, uh, N3DPA, n 3 docosapentanoic acid derived resolvents, which increased very early on in the morning and then subsequently declined throughout the day. And this was linked or coincided with an increase in monocyte activation measured as an increase in CD11B, and we also saw, saw a little bit of a trend in platelet monocyte aggregates. And platelet monocyte aggregates are important because they are one of the main reasons that, the, the one of the main mechanisms that leads to cardiovascular inflammation, as well as thrombus formation in the vasculature, that, so leading to myocardial infarct and stroke, for example. And what we found was that in patients with cardiovascular disease, the formation here shown in red, the formation of these molecules was significantly reduced at all intervals tested. And this was linked with an increase in activation of peripheral blood monocytes and with plated monocyte aggregates. So this suggested to us that a loss in the formation of these mediators 
could be at least linked with this increase in monocyte and platelet activation. And indeed, what we found was there was a significant negative correlation between the concentration of these mediators and platelet monocyte aggregates in patients with cardiovascular disease. And if we incubate peripheral blood from patients with cardiovascular disease with, the, with two of these mediators shown here, we see that there's a significant improvement or a significant reduction in platelet monocyte aggregates as well as in monocyte activation measured by CD11B expression. And so this tells us that in healthy people, there is a circadian regulation of these mediators that, that is upregulated very early on in the morning, and we found that this happens through an increase in acetylcholine and neurotransmitter in peripheral blood. And this is important because during these early hours of the day, we see an increase in blood pressure that is part of the normal wake-up wake up cycle when, as, as we're about to wake up, our blood pressure goes up to help us wake up better. And this increase in blood pressure activates peripheral blood cells because there's an, inc an increase in shear stress. And the upregulation of these pro-resolving mediators help keep this under control. When we lose the formation of these mediators, as what happens in patients with cardiovascular disease, there's an increase in peripheral blood leukocyte activation, and this predisposes to increased vascular inflammation. Another aspect that we've been interested is in the regulation of microparticles or microvesicles. These are small membrane-bound vesicles that are produced by all the cells in our body, and over, the re over recent years, it's become appreciated that these are, these are little packages of information that each cell releases and it influences the microenvironment around it. And so we questioned whether these mi what, what these microvesicles were doing during acute inflammation. And we first started by looking at the formation of microvesicles or microparticles um, during a, an, a self-limited inflammatory response, so an inflammatory response that it goes away by itself. And what we found was that there was a, very, there was a sharp increase in microvesicle production during the initiation phase, but these, molecule, these uh, vesicles lingered on during the resolution phase, suggesting that they played a role both in the initiation as well as in the termination of inflammation. So we went on to investigate what the role was during the resolution of inflammation, and what we know is that um, clearance of apoptotic cells by macrophages is a central aspect of the resolution of inflammation. And so we question whether these microvesicles could regulate clearance of apoptotic, neutroph apoptotic neutrophils by macrophages. And indeed, what we found was there was a dose-dependent increase in the ability of macrophages to clear apoptotic cells when they were exposed to microvesicles. And these microvesicles also were important as, uh, as a source of precursors for the biosynthesis of lipid mediators, and they shift the lipid mediator profiles of macrophages. So suggesting that indeed these molecules are involved in regulation of inflammation through regulation of processes that are central to resolution. And so we question whether we can use this as a delivery system to, to regulate inflammation. So what we did was very simple. We enriched these microvesicles in pro-resolving mediators and assessed their ability to regulate inflammation. And what you see here is the number of cells that are recruited following um, an inflammatory stimulus here at time zero. So this is uh, mice that were just given the inflammatory stimulus. And these are mice that were given the inflammatory stimulus and treated with some of these nanoprorosolving mediators um, and w that were enriched in one of the prorosolving mediators. And what you can see is there's a significant reduction in the number of cells that are recruited to the site. And there is a reduction in the length of time that it takes for inflammation to go away. Um, and the other aspect that we've, we've been recently involved in is assessing uh, the role of pro-resolving mediators in aging. And as we know, as we age, our inflammatory response increases. And this, we could model this in, in animal systems, in mice, where if you get uh, a young mouse, 
you have a, a, a limited number of cells that infiltrate the site of inflammation following challenge. And this is doubled in an old mouse and it takes also a lot longer for the old mouse to clear an inflammatory response. So we go from 10 hours to 18 hours. We also see that there is an increase in the production of inflammatory cytokines, like for example, IL-6, and a reduction in the ability of these old mice to clear apoptotic cells. And this is important because if you have an accumulation of dead cells in your, at the site of inflammation, this is one of the mechanisms that amplifies inflammation and is also involved in, in diseases like arthrosclerosis. So we looked at lipid-mediated biosynthesis in these old mice, and as you can see, in a young mouse, there is a nice temporal shift in the formation of lipid-mediators at the site of inflammation, and this is completely lost in, with aging, suggesting that there's a disruption in pro-resolving mediator formation. And so we question whether we can use these nano-pro-resolving mediators to help rectify the inflammatory response in old mice, so we constructed nanoprorosolving medicines that are in, were enriched in two of the mediators, aspirin triggered resolving D1 and resolving D3. And what you find is there was an increase in the ability of, um, of macrophages to phagocytose apoptotic cells when, they were, when mice were treated either at time zero or two hours after the initiation of inflammatory response in sort of a treatment paradigm, if you will. Um, as well as an increase in the ability of, uh, um, of, the, uh, of cells to, to, clear, to be cleared from the site of inflammation, of neutrophils to be cleared from the site of inflammation. So suggesting that if we, we re replenish pro-resolving mediators in aging, we can improve the inflammatory response by, by improving aspects of resolution such as clearance of apoptotic cells and clearance of leukocytes from the site of inflammation. And so this brings me to my, some of my conclusions. So we currently use a treatment approach that was really pioneered, if you will, by Hippocrates. Because in his time, he used to give people the bark of willow tree to treat inflammation. And this we now know is rich in salicylates. And unfortunately, whilst it is effective to some extent in, in limiting inflammation, it is not by no extent a treatment for inflammatory disorders. So by looking at the other side of the coin of a, of a typical inflammatory response, we now can see that there are novel avenues for the treatment of inflammatory conditions by using pro-resolving mediators. And the advantages here is that instead of infl inhibiting inflammation, we are counter-regulating the production of pro-inflammatory mediators. So we're not completely inhibiting their production, but just reducing their production. Because these pro-inflammatory mediators are important for our ability to control inflammation. We might have inflammation in one side that we want to reduce completely, but those molecules might be important at a different site in a different organ to help us protect, be protected from, say, an infection. So we don't want to completely inhibit their production. We also want to reprogram the immune response, both the innate and the adaptive immune response, and this is what pro-resolving mediators do. And we want to promote tissue repair and regeneration, and we know these mediators um, help in, in, in re repairing of, of tissues and the, also the regeneration of tissues. There's some very nice studies from Tom van Dijk's group, for example, in the periodontium, showing that you can regenerate bone um, with, uh, with these mediators. And so we think that this approach will help, will be advantageous because it will exploit the body's own mechanisms to repair and regenerate itself. And in doing so, we're modul we're, all we're doing is modulating the signals and the system to be protective. And hopefully this will give us a lower burden of side effects. So I hope I've convinced you that these pro-resolving mediators are produced during the resolution of inflammation, and they, re they program and reprogram key processes in the establishment of inflammation, of, of homeostasis, and both during infectious as well as sterile inflammation. 
This family of mediators are important in regulating peripheral blood leukocyte responses in a, in, under diurnal mechanisms and on an everyday basis, basically. And disruption in their production is associated with cardiovascular disease onset or at least progression. Aging disrupts prorosorbic mediator production and restitution of prorosorbic mediators helps restitute the immune response in aging. The cannabinoid system and the SPM systems are, can act synergistically to control physiological responses to inflammation, both as, um, as uh, both where the prorosorbic mediators act as elasteric modulators to the cannabinoid receptors, as well as by upregulating up regulating prorosorbic mediator production. And we can harness the, pro the, the biology of these mediators, as well as the biology of microvesicles by producing nanoprorosorbing mediators that help improve and, and reprogram the immune response during acute inflammation. So with that, I'd like to thank obviously members of my group. As you can see, we recruit very early in my group, um, <laughs> as well as our funding bodies and our collaborators without which we wouldn't be able to do this work. And I thank you for your attention.